Hello, I am uh, Jean-François Clairvoy, astronaut of ESA, the European Space Agency, flown three times in space on board the Space Shuttle. I am also the chairman of Novespace. Novespace, a company which owns and operates this aircraft, which works really as a true research laboratory. On board today, we have a special flight because we have scientists from all agencies that are already partner for the space station, the ISS, working on life science. We have people invited by NASA, by the European Space Agency, the French Space Agency, the German Space Agency. And now I have the different people explaining to you the kind of research we do in this aircraft. Sébastien Roquet. Thank you, Jean-François. Hello, everybody. I'm Sébastien Rouquet, a project manager of parabolic flights uh, in French uh, space agency, the CNES. And uh, it is really a, a very special campaign today because it's an entire agency, partial gravity campaign. So it is dedicated to uh, life science and, and particularly human physiology. It's a very interesting subject in microgravity because physiology uh, human life and human and life science and human uh, physiology depends uh, on, on gravity. And it is really interesting to study it in microgravity, but also in partial gravity, because it allows us to understand um, the physiology, global physiology, our adaptation to space and to prepare future uh, human spaceflight, but also to understand some disease uh, on the ground, like balanced disease, for example. So we have a kind of experiment. We have eight experiments on board today, and we had a, f we had a flight today, this morning. Uh, we, had we have eight experiments on board on life science and biology. Uh, the one I want to present to show you is uh, um, a proposal from uh, a neuroscience uh, center, a research center in Lyon, in France, and uh, the, it is dedicated to understand the uh, equilibrium, or the perception uh, of gravity. So, precisely, one test subject will be uh, is seated in in this uh, in this seat, and the operator stimulates his inner ear and perturbates the sensation, the per the perception of gravity. So, perception is a very very complex system. It grabs information from the eyes, from uh, sensors. Uh, body sensors, but also the inner ear, which is also called vestibular system. So when perturbated vestibular system, you perturbate all the system. And it's really interesting to, un to understand what happens in partial gravity. This experiment has already been done in 0G or in 1G, but it's really important to uh, feel and to, to, to feel the gap between 0 and 1G to fully understand the phenomenon and the very complex machine. So this is uh, one of these experiments, and I will now move to another experiment, interesting experiment, uh, a NASA experiment, uh, which is on board, and uh, I will invite David Martin. Come on, David. I will invite David Martin to tell us uh, a little bit more about this very interesting uh, uh, experiment. Well, the uh, cardiovascular and, and vision laboratory uh, wants to better understand the vision changes that are occurring with astronauts during long duration flight. It is uh, our belief that uh, it is our belief that the uh, primary cause for these vision changes is the headward fluid shift that occurs during uh, weightlessness and the uh, uh, congestion in terms of uh, blood flow leading the brain uh, that is caused by that. Uh, we're hoping with these flights uh, we can we can determine if we can sufficiently uh, if we can sufficiently reduce the amount of uh, headward fluid shift that occurs in a space flight. And we've done this kind of research before, both on the ground and also on the International Space Station in zero gravity. This gives us the opportunity to fill a knowledge gap by also adding uh, partial gravity to, the, to this. Uh, and we do that using ultrasound, which they're doing right here, of the neck. Again, looking at blood flow towards the head, or towards and away from the head. And we're also using a, uh, an eye sensor that goes in the eye that we're not currently utilizing. And that's in addition to uh, blood pressure and heart rate monitoring. And we're hoping the result of all this is that we'll be able to better protect astronauts on longer missions, like possibly to the moon and, and Mars. Thank you very much, Martin. Now we move to the back of the aircraft, and I will pass the. I will give the microphone to my colleague Katrin Stang from uh, DLR, the, the German 
uh, Space Agency. Thank you, Sebastian. Hello, everybody. My name is Katrin Stang, as Sebastian mentioned. I am the DLR Parabolic Flight Manager. And on this very special campaign, we have three German experiments on board, and I would like to present two of them to you now. To one of them, we are standing quite close, so what you can see behind me is the instrument called Flumias. It was built three years ago, and inside of the silver dome, there is a confocal fluorescence microscope. This microscope uh, used frequently in laboratories on ground, but uh, since three years, we have one available for research in our flying laboratory, the A310. So confocal fluorescence microscopy gives us, gives us the possibility to have an insight directly into the living cell and receive pictures in live cell imaging quality, high resolu resolution and three-dimensional structure over time. Currently on this partial gravity campaign, uh, an experiment from the University of Freiburg is making use of this instrument and they are interested in how the gravity perception of plants is really occurring because there are many mechanisms that are still not unknown and have to be unraveled. What we can see in the behind, behind me on the left hand side shown on the screen is now an image or more it is a stack of images that has been recorded today and it shows root cells of the plant Arabidopsis thaliana. It's a model organism in biology and uh, scientists are interested in how really the signal pers um, transduction uh, with regards to gravity sensing is happening inside of these cells. And this will give answers on how root tip formation when they are growing uh, is really occurring. This also takes us a step further if we think about exploration because if we one day go to Moon or Mars, we need to know if the plants and how the plants are growing there and if they are able to grow as they do on Earth. So we will move on to a second German experiment. This is over here. It's an experiment that makes use of test subjects and it comes from the German Sports University of Cologne. So the scientists are interested here in this experiment to get new insights by applying the partial G levels um, and uh, learn more about how the human brain reacts to this partial G levels, especially how the neurocognitive performance is doing under partial gravity levels. What you can see here is one test subject. It is equipped with an EEG. This EEG system will record the um, cortical brain activity. And for assessing how the human brain is functioning, um, the test subjects will have to do a lot of tests that are to be answered on the screen. And this is played on the screen for assessing the neurocognitive performance and how the neurocognitive performance really works out. It has been found on former microgravity campaigns that there was a positive impact of these short-term microgravity levels um, which uh, the test subject was exposed to. But this is in contrast to findings we know from astronauts from long-term space missions. So, And we hope that with the usage of this uh, partial G level campaign, there will be shed more light into the underlying mechanism, not only for the better and health maintenance of astronauts in space, but also for people on Earth. I'm handing over now to Neil. He's standing close beside me. Please, Neil. Thank you very much, Katrin. So, hi everyone. I'm Neil Melville. I'm the ESA Parabolic Flight Coordinator. Uh, I'm very pleased that uh, ESA has four experiments on the flight this week. Uh, this is the first one I'd like to talk about. They're from TNO in the Netherlands, and they're investigating the concept of self-tilt. Now, we're all quite good at knowing which way is up in gravity. Even if we close our eyes and tilt our head, we're still pretty good at it. But the tilt does make us worse, and definitely reducing gravity makes us worse at this. We know that in zero gravity, you have no sense at all of which way is up. So this experiment is investigating the various reduced gravity levels and changing the tilt and asking these guys wearing a virtual reality headset to control a line inside their field of vision to point the way they think is up. So we're perturbing their physical tilt, we're perturbing the gravity, and we're asking them to give us their self-tilt. And this will tell us a little bit more information about when self-tilt information starts to break down in these low gravity environments, which will tell us what kind of uh, gravity 
we will need for long-term space missions uh, to be able to maintain a human orientation. Uh, so let's move on to uh, another experiment, also from the Netherlands, from the uh, Erasmus University in Rotterdam. It's quite related. They're also looking at this kind of phenomenon. However, they are uh, disentangling the different mechanisms. So rather than having the whole body tilt, you can see it, you can feel it, and you get the inner ear sense. Here, they are perturbing only the inner ear by using an electrode to directly stimulate the nerves. This means that they can uh, induce a feeling of rotation, of tilt, without any physical movement, and then, therefore they can use the uh, data to validate the models that we think we have that explain how these mechanisms work in the human brain. And the output that they are measuring here is uh, looking at involuntary eye movements as a result of this electrical stimulation. And again, going through all the different partial gravity levels will allow the, the scientists to fill in the graph, to fill in the, the values that we don't yet have. We have numbers for 1G, we have numbers for 0G, and with partial gravity levels we hope to fill in all the numbers in between and validate the understanding that we think we have. Moving on to the third ESA experiment from the University of Freiburg in Germany. Uh, they go a, a step further, they're looking at postural dynamics and how this is affected. So you can see these two platforms that the test subject is standing on. They can move, be perturbed randomly backwards or forwards together or one foot at a time. And the subject is trying to balance. And in 1G, of course, we are very good at this. In 0G, we would be useless and floating off the platform. Somewhere in between, the involuntary human stumble reactions will start to break down and we're investigating exactly when that happens and how that happens. And this will inform, uh, again, the, the levels of microgravity, of partial gravity, that can be useful for, for long-term spaceflight without uh, causing undue problems for the astronauts, because we'll understand what the human form can deal with easily and when it goes too far. So moving on to the fourth experiment. This team is from... Uh, the, from Northumbria University in Newcastle in the UK. And again, they're looking at postural dynamics, but this time related to the spine. We found from long-term microgravity exposure that certain of the core muscles along the spine degrade quite significantly, but very, very specific ones. So what this team is doing is using uh, electromyography, so wires into the muscles around the spine to measure their uh, electrical activity and then in different gravity levels, they are perturbing the test subject by pushing with this rod on their back. And the test subject has to try and remain upright using those core muscles. And this response varies from 1G down to 3 quarters G, half G, 1 quarter G. And we're finding the point at which some of these muscles stop responding in the normal way. And the ultimate objective would be to develop countermeasures, exercises and training that astronauts could do to target those specific muscles um, to try and mitigate this degradation that we see at the moment. Um, so that concludes all of the experiments on the plane. Uh, we've been very glad to, to welcome you here and show you what we're doing. We hope you got a, a feel for it. We had a great first flight this morning. We're hoping for two more good flights in the next two days. And of course, we have to thank Novaspas, uh, who have uh, hosted us here the last couple of weeks, have worked with us for months to prepare all of this. Uh, they run this plane uh, wonderfully for us, and it's a real pleasure to be here every time in this remarkable laboratory. So thank you very much, Jean-Francois. Thank you, Neil. So now that you had a good description of the interesting things, interesting science we do on board the aircraft, come with me. I will show you another fun part. This is how we do it in the cockpit. So I will pass the microphone to Thomas Pesquet and together with the chief pilot, uh, Eric Delsal, they will describe how they do, this. They, they do it in the cockpit. You see it's very unusual. Thomas. Thank you. All right, hi everyone, uh, welcome to the cockpit. So this is where the magic happens. Uh, I'm sitting here with Eric Delsal, who's our chief pilot. Anything that flies in the world, he flew on it, guaranteed, except maybe the birds, but that's not even sure. Um, and so the way it's done, it's, it's very special. It's a, it's a rather old plane, it's not really high technology, it dates back from the 70s. Um, and the way we use it, con contrary to any other type of, of uh, airliner, we fly it 
three pilots at the same time, which is very special. One pilot is going to be in charge of the roll axis using those straps on the, on the control wheel. Second pilot is going to be in charge of the pitch axis. And for the pitch axis, as you can see, uh, there's, there's a second stick that only has pitch. You cannot roll with that stick because you don't want to give inputs on the roll axis. You're only ever managing one axis. Pitch axis, up and down, roll axis, inclining the, the body of the plane. And the third pilot is going to be sitting here and he's going to manage the engines. So he's in charge of controlling the speed and the acceleration on the X axis of the aircraft. So the way it's done, uh, we're in, le in level flight, steady flight, flight level 200 which is six and a half kilometers, pretty much. And we pick up some speed up to 325 knots, which is almost the maximum speed, airspeed of the plane. Once everybody's ready, the roll pilot is in charge of the timing of the maneuver and he's gonna make the, the, the announcements. He's gonna start the maneuver. The pitch pilot is gonna slowly pitch and then he's gonna follow 1.8 G on the accelerometer, which is the only instrument that we've added on that plane. Everything else is, is pretty much standard, uh, but for the accelerometer. You follow 1.8 G, pitch up, pitch up, pitch up, up until uh, a pitch angle of 47 degrees, which is really high. If you take off in an airliner, it's 15, 15 degrees, 17, 20 degrees maximum, so it's more than twice as much. Uh, 47 degrees, there are the, the pilot controlling the engine is going to reduce to idle thrust. 50 degrees, the roll pilot is going to give the, the instruction to inject on the parabola. And once you're on the parabola, you're on a ballistic flight. You're not really airborne anymore. You're like a, a cannonball. You're on a, you're, on a, you're on a ballistic flight. You follow the zero on your accelerometer when you're a pitch pilot. The roll pilot is going to use the straps to, to control the inclination of the aircraft. And it's really important that we keep our, our wings level. And so the roll pilot is going to take care of this, is going to follow the maneuver, is going to give all the instructions, and the pitch pilot is focused on the, on the zero. So you start, you start to pitch down, 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 down. The nose goes down below the horizon and all the way down to minus 45 degrees, which again, is, it feels like it's almost vertical and you're going to hit the earth really soon. So the aircraft is obviously picking up a lot of speed. Um, and again, on the instruction of the pilot, uh, you're going to do your, your pull-up maneuver and then you follow again 1.8 G and come back to a level flight. If, if the maneuver has been done perfectly, which it already is, let's be, let's be honest, and, uh, and if, the, if the headwind or the tailwind is not too strong, you come back exactly uh, where you started, flight level 200, 325 knots. So that's one parabola uh, and then we're doing 31 parabolas for zero G during a flight. Uh, today, for this week, we're also experimenting with different levels of gravity. We're targeting uh, 0 0.25 Gs, 0 0.5, 0 0.5, and uh, 0 0.75. So it's the same principle, not exactly the same maneuver, but same principle, different targets on the accelerometer. So that's it in a nutshell. Now you know how to fly a parabolic flight. There's only seven pilots in, in, uh, in France that are qualified to do this and in Europe. Uh, and, uh, and, they are the best. and they are obviously, yeah, and, and, and we're two of them. You got two of them, the chief pilot and the, the younger pilot, the, the, the beginner. Uh, so thanks for following the, this Facebook Live. And uh, we hope to see you maybe on an Air Zero G flight. You can discover the weightlessness in the cabin and have fun. And uh, we'll be in charge of taking care of you. Thanks. Thank you, Thomas. And you can go on the website uh, airzero-g.com. Everything is explained about this aircraft. And uh, we can we explain also the kind of research we do on board. Bye bye. Thank you.